today is going to be from the book of Numbers, so if you'd like to turn there, I'd like to talk about a character who, uh, this man, uh, is significant uh, because he shows up a lot in the New Testament, and, or at least in two or three places, uh, is mentioned uh, by writers in several other Old Testament books, and uh, just in general, is an important figure for how um, we uh, describe false teachers. Uh, I'm talking, of course, of um, Balaam, son of Baor, this uh, bad prophet, or something along those lines, uh, back in Numbers. Uh, his story starts in chapter 22, and we're actually going to hit the highlights of several chapters here in the middle of this, uh, this important book. But just for some context here, um, some of the other books of the Bible describe um, Balaam in some different ways. Joshua significantly talks about him in a couple of places. Uh, in uh, the Joshua and uh, uh, chapter uh, 13, verse 22, uh, the scripture says, The sons of Israel also killed Balaam, son of Baor, the diviner, with a sword among the rest of their slain. The border was the sons of Reuben was the Jordan, and this was the inheritance of the sons of Reuben according to their family. So we're talking here um, about the conquest of Israel and the peoples that were driven out at that time. And this guy we're going to talk about was one of those people who was purged. He was one of the people of the land um, the, Israelites, the Israelites were taken at that time. Uh, then in uh, uh, chapter 24, and verses 9 and 10 of Joshua, uh, the Lord speaking through Joshua says that Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel. And he sent and summoned Balaam, the son of Baor, to curse you. But I was not willing to listen to Balaam, he, so he had to bless you, and I delivered you from his hand. Uh, so th this is a recounting of some of the events that were happening prior to Israel's taking of uh, Canaan uh, in land beyond the Jordan that we talked about this morning in our Bible class um, as uh, Gibeon, no, sorry, uh, Gilead. Um, so when we're looking at this, uh, that kind of gives you an idea of where we're looking. This is before crossing over the Jordan, the Israelites are still in the wilderness uh, to the east. Uh, some of the other things about Balaam, just based on his name and his uh, moniker, uh, son of Baor, um, there's a possibility he was uh, descended from the first king of Edom, who was named Bela, son of Baor. Um, and that uh, figure can be found in Genesis chapter 36 and verse 32. Then again, some commentators actually think that both um, that king, um, who was somewhat of a, a tyrant, uh, and Balaam both picked really kind of flashing sounding names for themselves and that they really didn't have any relation to each other. Um, Balaam itself means devourer, um, and, and Baor means uh, either a consuming fire or you can, you know, something that consumes. Um, so, you know, if you name yourself devourer or son of fire, and you're, you call yourself a sorcerer, you may just try to be trying to look cool. Um, it may not actually be your given name. Um, but that's the, how we know this character, Balaam, son of Baor. Um, so in verse uh, 1 of chapter 22, we start to see uh, where the Israel are, Israelites are um, in relation to the uh, people that are going to start opposing them here. The Israelites are camped on the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan opposite here. So they're at that sort of northern part of the Dead Sea, right across the Jordan from Jericho, where we've been spending a lot of our time in our Bible classes looking conquest, uh, and especially that initial incursion in, across the Jordan. But at this point, they're still on the other side of the river. Um, they're still uh, caught, you know, taking over these lands that would eventually become um, the possession of the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And so here, the Moabites that are in this land are going to try and uh, oppose uh, Sorry, uh, they, they're the Edomites specifically, but also the Moabites as well, are going to be trying to oppose the people here. Um, specifically, I say, you know what? I say Edom you know, because I was actually thinking of that earlier king of Edom, and I wrote it down wrong in my notes. I used Moab the first time, and I confused myself. So there we go. Uh, and I, I will readily admit, I do make the 
mistakes from time to time. If you ever catch me in one, go ahead and bring it up. Um, we will uh, happily resolve those things, especially when I'm trying to talk really fast and read a lot of scripture all at once. All right. So we're talking about Balak, um, this uh, king who is opposing the Israelites. Uh, no matter where he's coming from, he is the king of God. And specifically here, he goes out and he calls for Balaam, um, who has this role, um, as we saw described in the book of Joshua, as a diviner. Uh, so, for those of us who aren't, you know, familiar with ancient Near Eastern magical arts, a diviner is a guy you go to when you want to know what the gods have to say. Right? You pay him a little bit of money, and he will get the gods on your side, or he'll give you a prophecy or things like that. Uh, and specifically, it's this kind of um, almost contract magic where you're saying, okay, I'll make a deal with you. If you support me as a god, then I will go ahead and honor you, and I'll give you these sacrifices and stuff, and we'll be on the same page. And you'll see that that's the role that Balak wants Balaam to perform here. Um, but God has different plans. So Balak um, sees the Israelites and he wants them um, to be removed as a danger. In verse uh, 5 there, he says this, Behold, the people came out of Egypt. Behold, they cover the surface of the land, and they are living opposite me. Now therefore, please come, curse this people for me, so that they are, because they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I might be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So uh, he's giving this credit uh, to Balaam here, and he wants Balaam to come and perform this curse for him. So the elders of Moab take the money, they go to Balaam to give him this offer, going, please come curse this you know, bunch of rabble that have come up out of Egypt so that they won't be in our area anymore. And uh, verse 9 God comes to Balaam and says, Who are these men to you? And Balaam introduces them or gives God the explanation for why they have come. And in verse 12, God says this, Do not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So, so Balaam arose in the morning and said to Balaam's leaders, Go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. And the leaders of Moab arose and went with Balak and said, Balaam refused to come. So, if this guy is a diviner, a sorcerer, you know, magician, why is it that the Lord is speaking to him? Well, our later description of him as a sorcerer, as a diviner, may have come from later actions. We're seeing him much earlier in his life, in this part of the story here in Numbers. But uh, it may also come from the way in which he communicated with the Lord, right? It, he already has this reputation there. The king of Moab already knows too. He whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. If that sounds familiar to you, that's very similar to the promise that God made to Abraham. So Balaam is probably a descendant of the Israelite people who has been living among the Canaanites, and he's sort of apostate. He's sort of gone astray. And he doesn't have zero connection with the Israelites. He's just, uh, he has been has gone astray uh, and on his own way rather than following the Lord. So that may be part of the explanation. The other part of the explanation is God speaks to whom he wants to. So if he had a message for Balaam, he can talk to Balaam. And we'll see um, how he chooses to do that here uh, in a couple of different ways um, throughout our story today. Continuing on though, um, Balaam isn't satisfied with this answer of uh, God says no so I won't do it. So he again sends more numerous and more distinguished leaders than the last delegation to once again ask uh, Balaam to come and do this. And he says, we will honor me richly, I will do whatever you say for me there, in verse 17. And Balaam uh, says, in verse 18, though Balaam were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not do anything, either small or great, contrary to the demand of the Lord my God. Now please, you stay here tonight, and I will find out what else the Lord will speak to me. God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men have come to you, rise up and go with them, but only do the word which 
which I speak to you, you shall do. So Balaam arose in the morning, and sat with his donkey, and went with the leaders of Moab. So at this point, Balaam hasn't, hasn't really done anything to be a villain in her story. So you might be wondering, why is it that every time they talk about uh, evil teachers in the New Testament, they bring this guy's name up, right? People came to him and said, we want you to curse the Israelites. And he says, I won't do it because God said no. And then God speaks to him directly. Those are all kind of prophety kind of things. Well, maybe it's to do with something with uh, Balaam's character that we don't get to see here. Maybe it's the way that um, Balaam is conducting himself in his own heart. Uh, but we can see that God opposes him um, and opposes the way he is approaching this situation because of God's response to Balaam actually going out. Now, I say that it has to do with something with the way that Balaam's heart is, because there's nothing in the actions he's taking to show that God should be trying to punish him for what he's doing. But he's going to get a punishment here in the next few verses. Let's look at chapter 22, I'm sorry, chapter 22 and verse 22 uh, a little bit more in detail than some of the verses that follow here. But God was angry because he was going. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in his way as an adversary against him. Now he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, the donkey turned off from the way and went into the field. But Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back into the way. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path in the vineyards, with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. And when the, do angel, the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed herself to the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall, so he struck her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in the narrow place where there was no way to the turn to the right or the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down on her Balaam. So Balaam was angry and struck the donkey with his stick. And the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? Then Balaam said to the donkey, Because you made a mockery of me. If there had been a sword in my hand, I would have killed you by now. And the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey, on which you have ridden all your life to this day? Have I ever been accustomed to do, do so to you? And he said, No. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his strong sword in his hand. And he bowed up all the way to the ground. Pick up in just a second. So you can see the kind of character that Balaam is at this point, right? The kind of attitude that he has. He's got his mind made up to do something, and he's going to do whatever it is. And the Lord is opposing his inward attitude and his hard-heartedness in the most <clears throat> powerful spiritual way possible, right? <coughs> Pardon me. He sent an angel to oppose him. And, we're, and it's so much so that it's completely obvious to a mute animal what's going on, where Balaam himself, who is a prophet who just spoke with God the night before, cannot see what's going on, right? That there's, there's a situation going on in front of Balaam where his, his hardness of heart, his bad attitude, his cruelty towards his lifelong companion here of his donkey, are demonstrating the kind of attitude that he has and what he was intending to do, whether his actions actually were wrong or not. So, the, there's this situation, right? God has sent his angel to oppose Balaam and to stop him in his tracks, and the donkey is trying to keep him from being harmed. So, uh, if we continue in verse 31, we see this. And the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. He saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with the strong sword in his hand. And he bowed all the way to the ground. The angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out as an adversary, because your way was contrary to me. But the donkey saw me, and turned aside from me three times. If she had not turned aside from me, I would surely have killed you just now, and let her open it. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you were standing in the way against me. Now then, if it is displeasing to you, I can turn back. So, once again, we're getting to this point here, right? God told Balaam to go. 
Balaam wasn't disobeying God in going. But there was something about the way in which he was going, the manner in which he intended to conduct himself when he got there, that was displeasing to God. That's the situation that is going on in front of us as we're reading the story. So now he says, okay, I get it. I, I won't go if you don't want me to go. But the angel doesn't say turn around. The angel says, go with the men. I will, but you shall only speak the word which I tell you. So Balaam went along with the leaders of the land. So he was in defiance in a way other than what his actions were showing. His sin was something other than what he was presenting to other people was obvious. But it had an effect on the way he was interacting with other people and other creatures in this case, right? Because of the way his heart was, he was willing to hurt his daughter. Because of the way his heart was, he was willing to uh, conduct himself in a shameful way like that. So, God took some extreme measures here, right? <laughs> Giving the, the donkey the opportunity to speak her mind. He took some extreme measures in presenting the angel here. But he also was intending to use even this bad actor, uh, this uh, wrong-headed, you know, evil kind of a person of Balaam to do what he wanted to do. Let's finish out chapter 22 and continue with our discussion. When the Lord heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet them in the city of Moab, which is on the Arnon border, at the extreme end of the border. Then Balak said to Balaam, Did I not urgently send to you and call you? Why did you not come to me? Am I really unable to honor you? So Balaam said, Balak, to Balak, Behold, I have come to you now. I am, able, am I able to speak anything at all? The word that God puts in my mouth, that I shall speak. Balaam went, went with Balak, and they came to Kiriath Huzov, and Balak sacrificed oxen and sheep, and sent some to Balaam and the leaders who were with him. And they came about in the morning, but Balak took Balaam and brought him up to the high places of Baal, and he saw from there a portion of the people. So, you know, in order for um, the curse to take place, uh, this Balak takes Balaam up to these high places, right? The worship in the ancient uh, Balaam's of their, uh, you know, false gods at that time, their idols, was almost always conducted on high places. Mountains and other places were considered places of honor because they were safe places, they were places... Uh, where you could see a lot of land, uh, and it was just generally considered auspicious for uh, conducting the attention of the gods. You, know, you go up to a high place where you can sort of knock on their door and say, hey, pay attention to me. Um, you may remember other places where um, prophets um, go up to high places to tear them down and things like that. And so we've gone up to one of these high places with Balaam here, um, but he doesn't use the worship site prepared for Baal, right? First, uh, the first few verses of 23 here, uh, we're going to see this pattern repeated a couple times, so we'll read, read it here, and then we'll see it again. Then Balaam said to Balak, build seven altars for me here, and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me here. Balak did just as Balaam had spoken, and Balak and Balaam offered up a bull and a ram on each altar. Then Balaam said to Balak, stand beside your burnt offering, and I will have Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me. Whatever he shows me, I will tell you. So he went to a bare hill. So he walks away from all of these altars and all of these idols or anything else that might have been constructed to get God's attention. He goes to some place where there's nothing at all. And he says, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, then the Lord comes to him. In verse 4, God met Balaam and he said to him, I have set up the seven altars and I have offered up a bull and a ram on each altar. Then the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak, and you shall speak with us. So he returned to him, and behold, he was standing beside his burnt offering, he and all the leaders of Moab. And he took up his discourse and said, From Aaron Balak brought me, Moab's king from the mountains of the east. Come curse Jacob for me, and come denounce Israel. How shall I curse for whom God has not cursed? And how can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? 
As I see him from the top of the rocks, and I look at him from the hills, behold, a people who dwells apart, and will not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob, or number the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright, and let my end be like his. So, obviously that doesn't sound like the curse that Balak is trying to hire this guy to give to him. So he has this very reasonable response, given what he was expecting. In verse uh, 11, what have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, but behold, you've actually blessed them. He replied, must I not be careful to speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? So after this point, uh, Balak is like, alright, this was just the wrong mountain. We just asked God on the wrong mountain, we're going to go to a different mountain, and we'll try again. Because this, this is what you do when you're a pagan, right? You, you just do anything that works, throw all the spaghetti at the wall, and see what sticks. And as soon as something works, that pleased the gods, and so we'll just do that as a ritual. So he's thinking this pagan mindset about the God of Israel, right? And he says, all right, uh, we're just going to go try another mountain. So he, this king and all the elders of his nation go, and they pick a different mountain, and they uh, set up this altar. They do the whole thing all over, and they've sacrificed all the sacrifices, and Balaam says, okay, stand here, I'm going to go off by myself, I'll get another um, word from the Lord, and this is what the Lord says to him, um, to the king through Balaam this time, verse 18. Then he took up his discourse and said, Arise, O Balak, and hear, give ear to me, O son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Where has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless, and when he has blessed it, and I cannot revoke it. He has not observed misfortune in his Jacob, nor has he seen trouble within Israel. The Lord his God is with them, and the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt. He is for them like the horns of the wild ox. For there is no omen against Jacob, nor is there any divination against Israel. At the proper time it shall be said to Jacob and to Israel what God has done. Behold, the people itself rises like a lioness. It has a lion. It is as a lion lifts itself. It will not lie down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. Then Balak said to Balaam, Do not bless them or curse them at all. But Balaam re replied to Balak, Did I not tell you whatever the Lord speaks that I must do? So uh, this time Balak's like, hey, You know what? I'm just going to give up. You know, it's, don't say anything. If you, if you can't stop speaking bless blessings, I prefer if you just didn't speak. He is so incensed at this, but he's not satisfied. They go once again to another place, to the top of Peor. And they do this whole ritual all over. Seven altars, seven rams, and seven bulls. So we've had all of this happen. And at verse 1 of chapter 24, we are getting Balaam's realization or his conviction over this whole situation. And looking at what's going on in front of him. Verse 24. What was chapter 24 right there? When Balaam saw that it was the Lord had blessed Israel, he did not go as at other times to seek moments, but set his face toward the wilderness. Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel camping, tribe by tribe, and the Spirit of God came upon him. And he took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Baor, the oracle of the man whose eye is opened, the oracle of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down, yet having his eyes. How fair are your tents, O Jacob, and your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens beside the river, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars by the waters. Water will flow from his buckets, and his seed will be like many waters. His king shall be higher than Agai, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt. He is for him like the horns of a wild ox. He will devour the nations for his adversaries and crush their bones in peace, and scatter them with his arrows. He couches, he lies down as a lion, as a lion who dares to rouse him. Blessed is everyone who blesses you, 
and cursed is everyone who cursed you. So this last sort of blessing from uh, Balaam is coming from the Spirit of the Lord that is taken at this point uh, is, is an exaltation seeing the camp in front of him, right? He's looking down at the entire nation of Israel and exalting what God has done in bringing them up out of Egypt. And so Balak's completely incensed. His anger has been kindled again and even stronger. Verse 10, then Balak's anger burned against Balaam, and he struck his hands together, and Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, but behold, you have persisted in blessing them three times. Therefore, flee to your place now. I said it would honor you greatly, but behold, the Lord has held you back from honor. Balaam said to Balak, Do not, Did I not tell your messengers who you sent to me, saying, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver or gold, I cannot do anything contrary to the command of the Lord, either good or bad, at my own accord. What the Lord speaks, that I will speak. And now, behold, I am going to my people. Come, I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the days to come. And he took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is opened, the oracle of him who hears the words of the Lord and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down, yet having his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob, a scepter shall rise from Israel, and shall crush through the forehead of Moab, and tear down all the possessions of Edom shall be a possession. Seir, its enemies, will also be a possession, while Israel performs valiantly. One from Jacob shall have dominion and will destroy the remnant from the city. And he looked at Amalek and took up his discord and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his end shall be destruction. And he looked at the Kenite and took up his discourse and said, Your dwelling place is enduring, and your nest is set foot. <clears throat> Nevertheless, Cain will be consumed. How long will Asher keep you? Then he took up his discord and said, Alas, who can live except God has ordained it? But ships shall come from the coast of Kittim, that shall afflict Asher and will afflict Eber, so they will also come to destruction. Then Balaam arose and departed and returned to his place, and Balak also went his way. So at this point, the high places that they had hoped would bring blessings from the gods have only brought curses against them and blessings against their enemies, right? These Moabites who were so sure that they found the right ally in Balaam have only found for themselves a curse. But what about our main character here? What about the guy we started talking about here? You know, it only seems like he's done stuff on behalf of God and his people. But he has only got punished and only got forced to speak things that he was not intending to speak. But that's kind of why his ending ends up being what it is, and he dies along with the rest of the people that are being purged from the land. See, Balaam's heart and his intentions and what he wanted to do and what God used him for didn't have to line up for him to be useful. That's why I think it's sometimes so confusing for Christians nowadays when we see things that sometimes look like they're what God would intend and sometimes look like they're, you know, things that he wouldn't, coming from uh, people that we would either, on one hand, assume would be enemies of God and sometimes would assume would be friends of God. When you see those actions being Sometimes it's all part of a plan that even the agents who are carrying them out don't really understand. And Balaam is a perfect example of a bad guy doing the right things at the right time to help good people. Now I say all that, but the Israelites were definitely not um, perfect themselves. In the very next chapter, after what we just read, the very next verse, even, Israel starts worshiping the idols. They start going astray themselves. The people that Balaam just 
bless three times and put curses on their enemies are themselves bringing themselves a curse upon themselves. They get a plague because of their uh, uh, unfaithfulness towards the Lord. And 24,000 people die as a result. So, my point is, uh, when you're talking about this bad guy, and talking about these good guys who did bad things, the bad guys who do good things, is that the best judge of what uh, our uh, place in God's sight is, is not the actions we undertake or even their results, but the heart that we have behind them when we carry them out. So when we see Jonah, who we talked about last month, was actually on uh, Independence Day, talked about good old Jonah, right? He was a prophet, and every time he's mentioned, it's only ever in good context in the New Testament, but he had a terrible attitude about it. But he still did the right thing. Now, Balaam, on the other hand, has a, the wrong intentions at heart and carries the right thing out, but gets cursed. So, what's the difference? Well, Balaam was looking to enrich himself. He was looking to make himself uh, more uh, well thought of. When you get called a sorcerer, you don't get called that because you're doing something in your closet for nobody to see. He was having these kings and these generals come to him, as the king had mentioned, because he had a reputation of blessing people fruitfully and cursing people with results. He was already practicing this magic before um, all of this took place, and the Lord used him for his purposes in this context. And I think the whole interaction with the donkey is just a really good indication of the kind of character, the kind of heart that they all had. He was very self-serving of everything he did. And where Jonah might have been reluctant to do good for bad people, he ultimately carried it out in a way that saved many people. Whereas uh, Balaam's reluctant good was just to reinforce uh, the uh, reputation of the Lord, maybe you might say, and to uh, continue to confirm that God was indeed on Israel's side. You know, uh, when, when we're taking this lesson and applying it to ourselves, it may not be cut and dry how to think about what other people are doing, right? That you can't always identify a good guy and a bad guy based on what they do. Sometimes the bad guys get stuff right, and sometimes the good guys get stuff wrong. And that's even true in the Bible. What's much more important, especially for us on an individual level as Christians, is to understand where our hearts are and make sure they're oriented towards God's purposes. It's much more essential for me to make sure that Ethan is right with God, than to go around and police every one of you and make sure, well, you know, brother, sister, that wasn't right. Or to look out into the world and say, now that over there, that's the bad guy, that's the enemy, that's the one God hates. Because God might still be using him for a purpose that I don't understand. It's much more useful for me when we're talking about the, the attitudes we have to know who I am and what I'm doing, so that when I do have questions from people about what God wants, when somebody does come to me and says, what is the will of God? I can look at what has been revealed to us through the scriptures and give a productive answer, because it comes from me knowing that I have done my best to follow what he says as well. Well, I hope this lesson has been uh, informative and interesting to you, if nothing else. Uh, and I hope that there's been some encouragement we can glean from it as well as we look at this uh, very unusual section of our spiritual history back in the numbers. If anyone has any concerns or uh, you know, uh, worries that we can help comfort you in, uh, if you have anything that we can uh, counsel you on, uh, or if anyone has 
not joined with Jesus in baptism uh, for the remission of sins. Uh, we offer this time now traditionally that you can take advantage uh, and come forward uh, to receive those, uh, anything we can do for you, those uh, offerings uh, that we can make on your behalf, prayers we can make for you uh, as we stand and sing.